Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So we are getting started with reading night today. Please keep in mind that some of the words are unfamiliar even to me. They are Jewish names and words and Hasidic words that uh, I will do my best to pronounce, but it's okay if we don't pronounce them. We do need to have a working familiarity with them and we can use context clues to help us understand the passage. Um, but we're not going to get everything perfect. It's a, a whole nother language for us. And um, so anyway, that being said, let's, um, let's remember that this is the story of a survivor. Elie Wiesel survived the Holocaust, and the Holocaust was an absolutely horrific part of history. Over six million people died and were killed, intentionally killed, in the, uh, in, the, in the Holocaust. And we talked about active and passive voice. The dying versus killing is very, very important because, yes, to be killed is to die. But to be killed is that active, intentional act towards another person's life. So it's not as if six million people got a disease and they just fell over and died. That would be six million people died. But we're talking about six million people being intentionally sought out, hunted, and killed. Children, teenagers, adults, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, families, villages, cities. They were Jews, and that's one of the reasons they were targeted. But they were also just people, and let's not forget that. They are people, and that's why I want us to study this book, because it's part of the reminder to us that humanity can go so wildly, horribly, evilly wrong. And it's easy for us to look at history and say, I would never participate in anything like that. I would never be a Nazi and participate in something like that. It's also easy for us to say, if someone came to my house and told me I had to leave, I'd just fight them and I'd just shoot them back. Those are easy things to say, but they are very difficult things to actually live and do. So uh, while we read this, number one, keep in mind, this is an actual historical story. This is a real man and this is his real experience in real horror and terror. Don't ever forget that this is not made up. Uh, this is real. Um, and so as you think about the historical framework, the historical context, as we move through his story, okay, keep in mind uh, about how things are transpiring, developing, growing. Try and put yourself in his experiences and in this world and see how would you feel? What would you really do? Um, and, and let's try and build some sympathy and empathy into our understanding of these terrible, horrible things. Let's also have a historical reminder to us that we need to, to fight every day, not physically fight, but, but really make the arguments, the best arguments, the best thoughts to bring out the best in humanity. Because we, as an entire group of people, can be warped and twisted so easily to do such heinous, evil things. So as I said, this is the story of Elie Wiesel. And we start when he is just a child. Most of it takes place as he was a young child, young adult boy. And um, so anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. They called him Moshe the Beetle, as if his entire life he had never had a surname. He was the jack of all trades in a Hasidic house of prayer. A shtibul. The Jews of Siget, the little town in Transylvania where I spent my childhood, were fond of him. He was poor and lived in utter penury. As a rule, our townspeople, while they did not help the needy, did not, sorry, while they did help the needy, did not particularly like them. Moshe the Beetle was the exception. He stayed out of people's way. His presence bothered no one. He had mastered the art of rendering himself insignificant, invisible. 
Physically, he was as awkward as a clown. His waif-like shyness made people smile. As for me, I liked his wide, dreamy eyes gazing off into the distance. He spoke little. He sang, or rather he chanted, and the few snatches I caught here and there spoke of divine suffering, of the Shekinah in exile, where, according to the Kabbalah, it awaits its redemption linked to that of a man. I met him in 1941. I was almost 13 and deeply observant. By day, I studied the Talmud, and by night, I would run to the synagogue to weep over the destruction of the temple. One day, I asked my father to find me a master who could guide me in my studies of Kabbalah. You are too young for that. Mammonides tells us that one must be 30 before venturing into the world of mysticism, a world fraught with peril. First, you must study the basic subjects, those you are able to comprehend. My father was a cultured man, rather unsentimental. He rarely displayed his feelings, not even within his family. And he was more involved with the welfare of others than with that of his own kin. The Jewish community of Seget held him in highest esteem. His advice on public and even private matters was frequently sought. There were four of us children, Hilda, the eldest, then B. I was the third and the only son. Despora was the youngest. My parents ran a store. Hilda and B helped with the work. As for me, my place was in the house of study, or so they said. There are no Kab Kabbalists in Seget, my father would often tell me. He wanted to drive the idea of studying Kabbalah from my mind. In vain, I succeeded on my own in finding a master for myself in the person of Moshe the Beetle. He had watched me one day as I prayed at dusk. Why do you cry when you pray? He asked, as though he knew me well. I, I don't know, I answered, troubled. I had never asked myself that question. I, I cried because something inside me felt the need to cry. That was all I knew. Why do you pray? He asked after a moment. Why did I pray? Strange question. Why did I live? Why did I breathe? I don't know, I told him, even more troubled and ill at ease. I don't know. From that day on, I saw him often. He explained to me, with great emphasis, that every question possessed a power that was lost in the answer. Man comes closer to God through the questions he asks him, he liked to say. Therein lies the true dialogue. Man asks and God replies, but we don't understand his replies. We cannot understand them because they dwell in the depths of our souls and remain there until we die. The real answers, Eliezer, you will find only within yourself. And why do you pray, Moshi? I asked him. I pray to the God within me for the strength to ask him the real questions. We spoke that way almost every evening, remaining in the synagogue long after all the faithful had gone. Sitting in the semi-darkness where only a few half-burnt candles provided a flickering of light. One evening, I told him how unhappy I was not to be able to find in Seget a master to teach me the Zohar the Kabbalistic works, the secrets of Jewish mysticism. He smiled indulgently. After a long silence, he said, There are a thousand and one gates allowing entry into the orchard of mystical truth. Every human being has his own gate. He must not err and wish to enter the orchard through a gate other than his own. That would present a danger, not only for the entering, but also for those who are already inside. And Moshe the Beetle, the poorest of the poor of Seget, spoke to me for hours on end about the Kabbalah's revelations and its mysteries. Thus began my initiation. Together we would read, over and over again, the same page of the Zohar, not to learn it by heart, but to discover within the very essence of divinity. 
And in the course of these evenings, I became convinced that Moshe the Beetle would help me enter eternity, into that time when question and answer would become one. And then, one day, all the foreign Jews were expelled from Seget, and Moshe the Beetle was a foreigner. Crammed into the cattle cars by the Hungarian police, they cried silently. Standing on the station platform, we too were crying. The train disappeared over the horizon. All that was left was thick, dirty smoke. Behind me, someone said, sighing, What do you expect? That's war. The deportees were quickly forgotten. A few days after they left, it was rumored that they were in Galicia, working, and even that they were content with their fate. Days went by, then weeks and months. Life was normal again. A calm, reassuring wind blew through our homes. The shopkeepers were doing good business. The students lived among their books, and the children played in the streets. One day, as I was about to enter the synagogue, I saw Moshe the Beetle sitting on a bench near the entrance. He told me what had happened to him and his companions. The train with the deportees had crossed the Hungarian border and, once in Polish territory, had been taken over by the Gestapo. The train had stopped. The Jews were ordered to get off and onto waiting trucks. The trucks headed toward a forest. There, everybody was ordered to get out. They were forced to dig huge trenches. When they had finished their work, the men from the Gestapo began theirs. Without passion or haste, they shot their prisoners, who were forced to approach the trench one by one and offer their necks. Infants were tossed into the air and used as targets for the machine guns. This took place in the Galician forest near Colomy. How had he, Moshe the Beetle, been able to escape? By a miracle. He was wounded in the leg and left for dead. Day after day, night after night, he went from one Jewish house to the next, telling his story of that of Malka, the young girl who lay dying for three days, of that of Toby, the tailor, who begged to die before his sons were killed. Moshe was not the same. The joy in his eyes was gone. He no longer sang. He no longer mentioned either God or Kabbalah. He spoke only of what he had seen. But people not only refused to believe his tales, they refused to listen. Some even insinuated that he only wanted their pity, that he was imagining things. Others flatly said he had gone mad. As for Moshe, he wept and pleaded, Jews, please listen to me. That's all I ask of you. No money, no pity. Just listen to me. He kept shouting in synagogue between the prayer at dusk and the evening prayer. Even I did not believe him. I often sat with him after services and listened to his tales, trying to understand his grief, but all I felt was pity. They think I'm mad, he whispered, and tears like drops of wax flowed from his eyes. Once I asked him the question, what do you want people to believe you? Why do you want people to believe you so much? In your place, I would not care whether they believed me or not. He closed his eyes as if to escape time. You do not understand, he said in despair. You cannot understand. I was saved miraculously. I succeeded in coming back. Where did I get my strength? I wanted to return to Seged to describe to you my death so that you might ready yourselves while there was still time. Life? I no longer care to live. I am alone. But I came back to warn you. Only no one is listening to me. This was toward the end of 1942. Thereafter, life seemed normal once again. London radio, which we listened to every evening, announced encouraging news, the daily bombings of Germany and Stalingrad, the preparation of the Second Front. 
And so we, the Jews of Siget, waited for better days that surely were soon to come. I continued to devote myself to my studies, Talmud during the day and Kabbalah at night. My father took care of his business in the community. My grandfather came to spend Rosh Hashanah with us so as to attend the services of the celebrated Rebbe of Borsh. My mother was beginning to think it was high time to find an appropriate match for Hilda. Thus passed the year of 1943. Spring, 1944. Splendid news from the Russian front. There could no longer be any doubt. Germany would be defeated. It was only a matter of time. Months or weeks, perhaps. The trees were in bloom. It was a year like so many others, with its spring, its engagements, its weddings, and its births. The people were saying, The Red Army is advancing with great strides. Hitler will not be able to harm us, even if he wants to. Yes, we even doubted his resolve to exterminate us. Annihilate an entire people? Wipe out a population dispersed throughout so many nations, so many millions of people? By what means? In the middle of the 20th century! And thus my elders concerned themselves with all manner of things, strategy, diplomacy, politics, Zionism, but not with their own fate. Even Moshe the Beetle had fallen silent. He was weary of talking. He would drift through synagogue and through the streets, hunched over, eyes cast down, avoiding people's gaze. In those days, it was still possible to buy emigration certificates to Palestine. He had asked my, I had asked my father to sell everything, to liquidate everything, and to leave. I am too old, my son, he answered. Too old to start a new life. Too old to start from scratch in some distant land. Budapest Radio announced that the fascist party had seized power. The regent, Miklos Horthy, was forced to ask a leader of the pro-Nazi Nihilist Party to form a new government. Yet we still were not worried. Of course, we had heard of the fascists, but it was all in the abstract. It meant nothing more to us than a change of ministry. The next day brought really disquieting news. German troops had penetrated Hungarian territory with the government's approval. Finally, people began to worry in earnest. One of my friends, Moshe Kayam Berkowitz, returned from the capital for Passover and told us, the Jews of Budapest live in an atmosphere of fear and terror. Anti-Semitic acts take place every day in the streets and on the trains. The fascists attack Jewish stores, synagogues. The situation is becoming very serious. The news spread through Siget like wildfire. Soon that was all people talked about but not for long. Optimism soon revived. The Germans will not come this far. They will stay in Budapest for strategic reasons, for political reasons. In less than three days, German army vehicles made their appearance on our streets. Anguish. German soldiers with their steel helmets and their death's head emblem. Still, our first impressions of the Germans were rather reassuring. The officers were billeted in private homes, even in Jewish homes. Their attitude toward their hosts was distant but polite. They never demanded the impossible, made no offensive remarks, and sometimes even smiled at the lady of the house. A German officer lodged in the Khan's house across the street from us. We were told he was a charming man, calm, likable, and polite. Three days after he moved in, he brought Mrs. Kahn a box of chocolates. The optimists were jubilant. Well, what did we tell you? You wouldn't believe us. There they are. Your Germans? What do you say now? Where is their famous cruelty? The Germans were already in town. The fascists were already in power. The verdict was already out. And the Jews of Saget are still smiling. the eight days of Passover. The weather was sublime. My mother was busy in the kitchen. The synagogues were no longer open. People gathered in private homes, no need to provoke the Germans. Almost every rabbi's home became a house of prayer. We drank, we ate, we sang. 
The Bible commands us to rejoice during the eight days of celebration, but our hearts were not in it. We wish the holiday would end so as not to have to pretend. On the seventh day of Passover, the curtain finally rose. The Germans arrested the leaders of the Jewish community. From that moment on, everything happened very quickly. The race toward death had begun. First Edict Jews were prohibited from leaving their residences for three days under penalty of death. Moshe the Beetle came running to our house. I warned you, he shouted, and left without waiting for a response. The same day, the Hungarian police burst into every Jewish home in town. A Jew was henceforth forbidden to own gold, jewelry, or any valuables. Everything had everything had to be handed over to the authorities under penalty of death. My father went down to the cellar and buried our savings. As for my mother, she went on tending to the many chores in the house. Sometimes she would stop and gaze at us in silence. Three days later, a new decree. Every Jew had to wear the yellow star. Some prominent members of the community came to consult with my father, who had connections at the upper levels of the Hungarian police. They wanted to know what he thought of the situation. My father's view was that it was not all bleak, or perhaps he just did not want to discourage the others, to throw salt on their wounds. The yellow star, so what? It's not lethal. <sighs> Poor father. Of what then did you die? But new edicts were already being issued. We no longer had the right to frequent restaurants or cafes, to travel by rail, to attend synagogue, to be on the streets after six o'clock in the evening. Then came the ghettos. All right, that is a heavy uh, beginning. Whew. So let's just go ahead and hit some of the, the important points about what we've read so far. See if I can summarize and help explain some of the more important things here. Okay, so um, we're talking geographically here. Now, the map, of course, has changed a little bit since the, the, the 1940s here. But essentially, uh, you, you heard him talk about the Hungarian police, but also Transylvania. So it's kind of in this region, and here's where Siget would be. So... You know, Germany is over here and the Czech Republic, Austria. So this is just kind of that central European area. And here, if you look up here, you can see a broader view of that central European. His Germany here and then Italy would come down here. So anyway, um, so that's where they are geographically. All right. Some of the things that we want to be thinking about as we read in humanity, and it's everywhere. We're going to talk about a couple of ex examples already. Faith and religion. Watch how uh, especially Eliezer's, or Eli as the author is called, um, how he tries to really balance his faith and his religion. He is a deeply devoted Jewish believer. Look at how hope or lack of hope transpires throughout the story. And of course, how the family connection. And we start off with Eli's family being very strong uh, family connection. As we read, just keep it, keep in mind all of these things. Plot. What is going on? Do you understand what the basic idea is? Who are the characters? Who are we talking about? The themes. Um, if it confuses you, stop, reread, or ask questions about it. What is the conflict? Now, big conflict, Germans versus Jews. Right? That's the big conflict here. But underneath that big conflict, there's going to be smaller conflicts. For example... Eleazar versus his father at times. Sometimes there will be some other characters and some other people in the story that have conflict. Keep an eye out for golden lines. What 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 is well written? What when you just go, wow, I like the way that sentence sounds. And in this book, there's going to be a lot of really sad and heartbreaking sentences that are very well written. And they're probably sad and heartbreaking because they were well written. And of course, anything that intrigues you, interests you, surprises you, 
those are things to keep an eye out for. All right, so um, this first chapter takes place over a long time span, many years. It starts in 1941, and we get very quickly through 42, 43, 44. So not a lot happened, okay? Not a lot of the major events happened at the beginning here. All right, here is a picture of what we might consider Hasidic Jews. You'll see they're very traditional shawl. Uh, a lot of them have the nice beards. Um, I'm not quite sure what they are. You can see this this guy up here. He's got the, the, the hair here, and this man here has it as well. Uh, and I'm not sure what that's called, but they'll have long locks of hair right here. And, of course, they all wear their coverings as well. All right. So as I said, geographically, it's what we would now call Romania. Um, but this is generally that area of where he was at here. So you get, the, as I said, the, the, the maps have been redrawn at least a little bit. All right, the Talmud is the Jewish name for their holy scriptures. We might consider it the Bible for, for many of us, you know, um, but the Talmud is their, their Jewish scriptures. All right, Moshe the Beetle. Um, I don't know if this is an exact photograph of him, but uh, if you look it up online, this is what you get. Uh, the Beetle specifically refers to the job that this man had. He was the church usher, the caretaker, kind of like a janitor of their synagogue. Um, so he just kind of helped to look over the facilities there of the synagogue, which, of course, is the Jewish church. All right. Um, what's fascinating here is these lines. Several days passed, several weeks, several months. Life had returned to normal. And we see this a number of times throughout these first few pages. Radical things happen, and then the next day, life just goes on. Um, so even though things have radically changed, eh, it is what it is. Let's just continue to live our lives, which... It's terrible because what we might call the slippery slope, right? One tiny little change suddenly leads to fast, radical slipping of massive changes. If at this point people had said, you know what? Stop. We're not going to take this. Maybe history would have been very different. But, eh, you know, eh, life is still okay. All right. The Gestapo. It's German's military police. Gestapo. You might pronounce it Gestapo, um, either way. But it's now the term that we use in general for that fascist military police. All right, uh, lorries. My original copy here of the book has lorries. They translate it to trucks. They're put onto trucks. All right, look at this. Babies were thrown into the air, and the machine gunners used them as targets. You guys, how horrifying. Absolutely horrific. It makes me physically sick and ill to read that. And I've read this many times and every time. It's just revolting. The inhumanity that one person could throw a baby into the air and then have another person gun it down. It's disgusting. It's sick. It's twisted. It's vile. It's evil. It's inhuman. And yet it was done by humans. It breaks my heart. How could a person do such a thing? To just violently kill people. Ugh. Critical readers, pay attention to how we go through these dates. Here's the point. Anything noteworthy happened in these, these years? Well, not really. In fact, life was kind of normal. They even talk about weddings and marriages and relationships. Uh, Ellie's mother talks about maybe we should find our older daughter a husband, you know, and, and think about the family. And just life, and people are just living, and the seasons change, and it's kind of nice weather. And they just were not prepared at all for the horrors to come. All right, it talks briefly about Palestine and going back to Palestine. Uh, Eliezer tries to convince his father, look, let's move. Now, this is the general region, and one of the reasons why it's so much controversy today and on this particular map, you can see we've got like the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, to this day, it's still being fought over by the Jews and the nation of Israel and the Palestinian people. And that is a huge socio-cultural historical thing. I'm not going to get into it. 
this generally is just Palestine that we would refer to as Palestine. And most of it is considered Israel uh, as a nation today. All right, billeted, it's when a you are forced to accommodate somebody to live in your home. So these German soldiers were given a place to live in the homes of these Jewish people. It's like as if uh, someone in the army knocked on your door today and said, hi, I am now living here, and then just move in. You get kicked out of your bedroom. You got to sleep in the, in the family room or in the garage or something, and they just take over your room, and they just live there. It does happen in times of war, um, but this, of course, was pretty shocking to have your enemies essentially knock on your door and say, we're moving in. What was surprising is that some of these soldiers were not so bad. They even brought chocolates to people. Eh, not so bad. Uh, talks about the Passover, very important Jewish holiday. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it comes from the Bible. Um, if you know anything about um, Moses and the Ten Commandments, this is where the Passover comes from. So it's a very, very important Jewish holiday. Anyway, we get this great line. The Germans were already in the town. The fascists were already in power. The verdict had already been pronounced, yet the Jews of Saget continued to smile. Here is what our author is telling us at this point. When we look at the broad historical narrative, we know how it ends. We know that six million people are killed. We know that our author survives. But he is looking back at his young childhood. And he says, look, the enemies were there. The enemies were in power. We knew what was going to happen. And yet we acted like we didn't know what was going on. Like, meh. Just continue to smile. The race toward death had begun. That's a good line. It's a terrible line. It's a sad line. But what it means is that things are going to speed up like a race. We're going to go faster and faster and faster. And what's the end line? What's the goal? Death. Death is the finish line. The race toward death had begun. So as we continue the story, it's going to get faster and faster as we move towards many people dying tragically and terribly. Along the same lines, we have this line where the, the father says, the yellow star, so they were forced to wear a band, okay, with the star of David on their arms. That way they could be identified. Oh, you're Jewish because you're wearing the star on your arm. You're wearing the band. Now I know who you are. Okay. And the father goes, meh, it's just a piece of cloth. We can deal with that. No big deal. But the problem is when you start to accept these tiny, tiny little uh, impositions on your life, that's where things radically start to change because it always starts small. Oh, we'll just do this. We'll just do this. We'll just do this. Now, likewise, similarly, right now in our COVID lockdown and, sh and, and shutdown, one of the reasons why people are so upset and pushing back against governors like Governor Newsom, is because these see these are these small incremental changes. Now, I'm not saying it's exactly the same. In fact, it's far from exactly the same. I do not think we are in the same situation as they were. But the similar ideas are how much power are you going to let people control? One man, the governor, is just decreeing stay at home. Are we going to listen? Uh, President-elect Biden is saying in his first 100 days, he's going to mandate a mask requirement. Okay, well, can just one man just decree and say, you must do these things? Is that the world we want to live in? That's kind of this idea here. Eh, it's just one thing. But then there's the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Now, Currently, that's what people in our culture are afraid of. It's, it's not the mask. It's not the stay at home. It's the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. How far are we going to let them go? How much power do we let them have in our lives? So that's this thing here. We get this great parenthetical statement where Ellie, the author, is looking back from the past. Now, he's seen everything. And he's looking back at what his father said. And he says, Dad, don't you get it? If it wasn't for that star on your arm, then what did you die of? If you had fought at that point, maybe things would have been different. If we didn't allow that, maybe life would have been changed. 
But we did die because of our Jewish faith. We did die because of these incremental little impositions on our life. Okay. Um, so the, the uh, da, 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 da. yes, we haven't gotten to there yet. All right. Thus ends our recording for today. I feel like that was kind of long, but there's just so much to candle in these pages. All right. I'll stop. I'll be done. Have a good day. Talk to you later.